Before we begin, thank you very much to Sunstorm9119 for joining my Patreon campaign. Thank you very much for the support. Uh, also, you'll forgive me if I'm rusty at this. I haven't done a review like this in a very long time, but today I have a challenge to address. And for that, we have to talk 90s animation and its desire to avoid original concepts. Ninja Turtles happens, so you get your Bucky O'Hare, Cowboys of Mumesa, Street Sharks, Biker Mice from Mars, Toxic Crusaders, because everyone wanted to be the next Turtles. It doesn't mean these shows were bad, most of them were pretty good. Or they were Toxic Crusaders. Power Rangers happened, so you got Superhuman Samurai, Cyber Squad, and Tattoo Teenage Alien Fighters from Beverly Hills, and no, I'm not making those names up. Point is, few original ideas came out, but when they made money, everyone had to be the next one. So when Mainframe proved that a fully CGI cartoon was possible, again, everyone wanted to get in on it. Except Mainframe understood the assignment. They knew the tech was limited, so their show, Reboot, took place with digital people in a household computer. The stiff movements, heavy polygons, and animations made sense for the context of the series. I'd argue their second show, Beast Wars, kept the same logic with robotic characters. It's the companies shamelessly jumping on the bandwagon where it gets bad, when they don't want to work within the text limitations. That'd be your Donkey Kong Country, Voltron, The Third Dimension, and today's topic. So, how did we get here? Because two cartoon characters on the internet ask me. Pumpkin Potion on the left, Party Demonus, aka Minerva, on the right, both brilliant VTubers on Twitch. They got to talking about 90s CGI shows, how bad the old animation was, and I'm in the chat thinking, AMATEURS! For I am the keeper of the forbidden knowledge, the true horrors of 90s animation that I alone am forced to remember. So I brought up today's topic, vampires, and it ended up unlocking a repressed memory. <gasps> TJ what? brought up vampires. That was a Van that was a fever dream. I remember seeing like maybe two or three episodes of. It didn't even feel like a real show. Van? That was weird. Hey, they were people that turned into cars. It was Isn't that weird. just Transformers though? No, it was people, people that turned into robots. Huh? DJ, have you made an episode? Have you made a video on this show? If not, where when will it when will it happen? Yeah, can we <gasps> DJ, can we can we can we get this? Clearly, clearly, this is uh this is outside Transformers lore, and I think that you need to do a secondary <laughs> video about about this new timeline. I think I think this would suit perfectly. I think it's perfect. It's a miracle Minerva is still a Transformers fan after being exposed to this. But she's a friend, and Pumpkin kind of seems like me in that she too remembers copious amounts of obscure animation. So, you know what? We're gonna do this. Now, it's not that I'm going to do anything a couple VTubers tell me to do. I honestly wanted to make this video for a long time. Uh, uh, oh. Uh. Here, here, they look sad. Here, let me give them five subs. You might ask, how is this relevant to a Transformers channel? Because this show is unique in its attempt at shamelessly aping popular shows of the time, as it tried to do two at once, Transformers Beast Wars and Power Rangers. Most shows are bad enough at doing one. How do you think splitting the difference did? Vampires came out in late 1997, after Beast Wars was well established and in the middle of CGI's infancy, where every cartoon wanted to use it, even in small bits, no matter how bad it looked. 
It's from a company called Abrams Gentle, which was originally just a shell company after Mego Toys went bankrupt. As you can see from the About page on their site, they are responsible for... absolutely nothing you remember. Their best success was Sky Dancers, flying buzzsaws kids held close to their faces, so that makes two products likely to blind children. When they branched out into animation, they worked on such series as Visionaries, Dragonflies, and Bucky O'Hare. Oh hey, they had a history of bandwagon jumping. Though to be fair, the show was made for Abrams Gentle. The actual production company was MSH Productions, which I tried to look up, but the only thing on Google was their stock performance, which is to say, no performance. Though honestly, I don't even know if this is them. Either they branched out into K-pop or more than one company has used the name. At the time, they didn't have the manpower to animate the whole show. So MSH hired a production company out of Hollywood called the Animation Factory to help out. They're credited as Dimension Studios or Imagine This Inc., but we'll keep calling them what they were originally known as. I tried to look them up too, and all I found was a website selling animated GIFs. I know, the companies that made vampires are all defunct. I was just as shocked as you. I mention Animation Factory because they did an interview with the South Florida Sun Sentinel newspaper, where I'm sourcing some of this info. It's also where I learned the budget of vampires. You see, when I tell people about this show, my go-to explanation is they tried to do Transformers and Power Rangers at the same time, but with half the budget of either, which was mostly a joke, but as it turns out, I'm not far off. An episode of Beast Wars in Season 1 cost an average of around $700,000, while Vampires cost $400,000. Power Rangers was closer, around $600,000 an episode, but even that was considered low budget at the time. Keep in mind, roughly 50% of the footage in Power Rangers is licensed from Super Sentai. It was already made, and yet, somehow, Vampires uses the latest in animation for each episode, and it still comes in 33% cheaper. This is one of those shows so broke that Craft Services is actually being made by Craft. Did you notice what we glossed over, though? The South Florida Sun Sentinel is a local newspaper. Why are they talking about vampires? MSH was located in San Francisco, and the article described Animation Factory as a Hollywood studio. So why do an article about companies in California? They didn't. There is also a Hollywood, Florida. So the show knocking off Power Rangers, knocking off Transformers, was partially made in a knockoff Hollywood. There are copies of the Star Wars Holiday Special that aren't this bootleg. Also, this explains so much. You had Floridians working on this series. Of course it was going to turn out like this. Anyway, we have to talk about the actual show at some point, don't we? The premise is pretty basic. A magic space meteorite crashes into an auto salvage yard, causing our four heroes to merge with the cars in the garage, as well as some of the junkers outside into the villainous vampires, fuel-draining robotic vehicles. The meteor sinks into the ground to form the villain's lair, while the teens wake up in their new mechanical bodies, somehow not dead from this whole experience. You know, I don't ask for much, but usually when a meteor makes an impact like this, it's got a far bigger blast radius that probably would have ended this show in about eight minutes. The kids are now called the Motorvaders, because it wouldn't be a Transformers knockoff if they didn't each get fancy faction names. And similar to Transformers, they all have cool, punchy names like Axel, Nuke, Rev, and these are the names before the car thing happened. As far as this show is concerned, those are their birth names because they're the only ones they ever use, and we're just left to wonder what parents were high or crazy enough to name their child Snap. I half expect his brothers Crackle and Pop to show up. Oh, and if you're wondering why I haven't described these adults pretending to be teenagers, it's because just watching this video this far has probably allowed you to imagine who these people are. Suffice to say, the serial mascots have more developed characters here. They're 90s teenagers with typical high school problems, and they really like cars. A little too much, really. They talk in car references. They play games about identifying cars. Their only hangout is a scrapyard full of cars. Lightning McQueen is not this obsessed with cars. 
Let's talk about the scrapyard though, Sunrise Salvage, the show's main setting and only setting. The show's sets consist of outside of a junkyard, the inside of a junkyard, and the basement of a junkyard. If they need another setting, it's usually filmed to hide just how small the space is, like they had to set up a mini set on the set they already had. It's like a YouTuber who has to set up a skit in the confines of their bedroom, and trust me, I've been there more than once. The trick is, I didn't have $5 million to work with. At least it's well filmed, I guess. The cameras follow the characters, there are some interesting angles they shoot from. Honestly, it's something even the good Power Ranger knockoffs did wrong. See, I can be fair here. I, it's not all bad. No, no, no. Now, if you want to talk all bad, we can talk the writing. Episode plots dared to break new ground in storytelling, like, oh no, the junkyard's going to get shut down, and oh my, the Tom girl wants to prove she can be a real girl too. The villain plots aren't too hard to guess either. Turn vehicles of war into vampires. Take over a gasoline factory w with open vats of gas for some reason. Did someone actually write this show without knowing how gasoline is made? Because like, I kind of feel like that's required reading. Want worse writing? The main cast talks almost entirely in car puns, and that goes for heroes and villains alike. I apologize in advance for the following segment, where I proceed to read to you every car pun said in the first episode alone. Yeah, speed read. My social life is in need of a major overhaul. We can't just sit idle for the rest of our lives. You've got 365 miles to go before you hit that 16th lap. I don't know if I can keep the emergency brake on all year. We are ready to roll. I'm feeling pumped. There shall be no rest stop. Let the carnage begin. I'm not feeling too up to speed myself. Tanks a lot, Nuke. Let's kick some asphalt. Looking a little tired there. You guys park it. I'll take the wheel from here. Time for a crash course. No drinking while driving. Did we kick their gas or what? I'm exhausted. I think I have gas. It's time for you to get motivated. I don't want to be the designated driver. And this is excluding the non-car puns also thrown out, as well as all the car references I didn't consider puns, and all the proper names of things that are also car puns, like the main villain cast. At this point, we finally have to discuss the animated side of the show, and I didn't know they could render CGI on an easy bake oven, but here we go. The titular vampires are led by the evil Dracula, and if you want a good idea of how little work the animators wanted to do, he's the only character in the main cast with an animated mouth. In a show about vampires, only one character is capable of biting. His henchmen are Ambula, a psychopath with a kit full of surgical weapons, Automaniac, an ice cream truck acting like a manic clown, and Cardaver, who is also there. Seriously, I searched this show up and down. He never really does anything. In the first episode of the show, his contribution to the big battle is sadly limping away from low fuel. This is followed by Snap slicing off his leg wheel and throwing him down the road while Cardaver poses no threat at all. Truly the hero we all need. But I mentioned them. Let's look at the motivators. And I apologize in advance because that means we have to look at them. Even in the 90s, it was impossible to see a humanoid car and not think Transformers. But even then, you had to know something was wrong with these hatchback hunchbacks. Even if these models were well rendered, the designs would still be unpleasant. They look like they tried on those transforming Halloween costumes and got stuck. What they don't look like are the vehicles they're supposed to be based on. I mean, to me, it's just a bunch of car parts with a face I'd normally see at the end of a Star Fox game. And why do the textures look so shiny? I'm half convinced you could peel them and find chocolate inside. When in motion, the animations are incredibly awkward with characters just flailing around or in extreme close-up. Since the characters have no mouths, this is how the show has to indicate who's actually talking. Gee, if only the source material they were copying had a solution for that problem. Fight scenes are slow and lack impact, and I was trying to find some bad PS1 or N64 3D fighting game to compare it to, but none of them were this bad or slow. Then there's the awkward choreography. Here we have Rev flying full speed at Ambula, 
and after two close-ups, Ambula has caught her from the opposite direction she was flying in from, with no flow between shots in the least. And yes, fly. Most of the time, the characters flew, which kind of kills the point of being cars, doesn't it? And for some reason, they were proud of their CGI, because they used it for everything, and I literally mean everything. When you see Sunshine Salvage from the outside, it's a CGI rendering. What, did the local scrapyard want too much money to let you film their door for five minutes? They abuse green screen as well, even when it doesn't make sense. Like if the characters are outside, they CG in the sky. You're telling me it was too expensive to film the sky? Not everything needs to be done on a green screen. You're making a Power Ranger knockoff, not a bad FMV game. We could have a real intimate relationship. You and I. Now, now, to be completely fair, some of this is probably down to the editing because that, as everything else in the show, is a mess. In episode one, the motivators meet Gypsy, another vampire who's actually on their side. She'll show up occasionally to spout advice, exposition, or pad out an episode with her stock animation. Here, she's explaining what vampires are, their need for gasoline, and the evil of Dracula. And Axel asks, Just who is this Dracula? Which is a weird thing to ask because two minutes earlier, he already knew his name in the middle of the fight. Dracula and I are gonna play a little game of chicken. Snap already knew Cardaver's name too, and it's not like they shouted their names out or anything before the battle. It's not that much like Power Rangers. It's like the exposition scene was just copy-pasted into the end of the episode instead of the middle, but it happens more than once in the same episode when the only thing that you can do to explain it is bad writing. For example, Grease Spot, a vampire dog made from a kid's big wheel. Rev just name drops it out of nowhere with no explanation. Also, for some reason, Grease Spot doesn't need fuel like the other vampires, and he's also the only one not affected by the one weakness of both vampires and night owls alike. The sun. For a vampire, seeing the sun rise means instant, burning death. For a night owl, it means we begin to regret our sleep cycle choices. It's a plot device that they use almost every episode to add some tension to the team getting back to the junkyard in time. Also, kind of makes you wonder when these kids actually sleep if their adventures always last all night. But if you've watched this far, you should know by now, they never actually explain that either. And the more you watch, the more that happens. Why is Grease Spot the only one not affected by the sun? Why doesn't anyone see these fights in the middle of the city going on? Why did the meteor only turn some of the cars into vampires? How did the meteor have the power to bring these cars to life? Why weren't four kids who dove for cover in vehicles with no roofs vaporized by the impact? Why do the vampires obsess over this city when they can go somewhere without motivators and more gas? Why is gas in this world 9.98 a gallon? Why are the reels going backwards when they fuel up? Why is Gypsy the only vampire that isn't evil? Why do the vampires have a talking toilet? Why am I a Minecraft model? Seriously, didn't they explain anything? You are probably asking where the Power Ranger part comes in though, and for that, we have to look at the show's formula. While they are robot cars in the animated portion, the flow of an episode is much closer to Power Rangers. Normal teen drama happens, the vampires attack the local city, and the kids find out and go in for a transformation sequence, which involves getting into the vehicles they bonded to, now called car fins. Car fins. Yeah, and you thought Stephanie Meyer said vampires back 50 years. They have a transformation cry, mission ignition, and in place of a morpher, they turn their finger into a car key to activate the car fin. I, I'm trying to imagine a toy aisle in the 90s if the show actually took off, just rows of boxes that look like severed fingers with a metal bone jutting out of them. You never actually see the teens become the motivators, by the way. It's always a hard cut between transformation and animation, even when they transform on the spot. Yes, despite being bonded to the car fins and the whole key thing, sometimes they just change wherever. I'm, I'm sorry, th this bugs me so much. Why set up an element that's meant to add tension, not being able to transform unless they get to their junkyard, just to ignore it whenever it's convenient? And if they can transform wherever, why bother having them run to their cars at their base? Again, no explanation. Don't try to think about it. I only need one aneurysm today. 
Speaking of their base, we do need a Zordon, a mentor to impart wisdom to our young heroes. But I guess an ex roadie will have to do. Meet Van Heelsing, who has the worst pun name in the show, but at least it got explained. Yes, I'm still angry about Snap. As a character, he's the owner of the Junkyard, a music-focused hippie who's just now starting to come down from his mushroom high that began in the 60s. And you want to know the really weird part? He's the closest this show gets to actually entertaining me. The rest of the cast are constantly overacting, and they get fairly hard to believe, but the eccentric hippie chewing scenery like bubblegum? I mean... That's actually kind of fun. He's obviously having a blast in the role, and it does make him enjoyable to watch. Somebody get me out of this giant burrito! I'd kind of like to know what else he's done, but unfortunately he's credited as himself. So this show denies me even that joy. Jeez, why did he have to vanish, but this show remains? It's the kind of show that should be lost to time, doomed to only exist on YouTube in 240p quality, ripped from an old VHS recordings by someone whose childhood was so sad they only had this to entertain them on Saturday mornings. However, it was saved from oblivion thanks to Michael Bay and his Transformers movies in 2007, which is one more atrocity I can blame on that man. The show was released on DVD by a company called Peter Pan, which is appropriate that the company is named after a character known for manipulating children. I say this because the DVDs were released under the name Vampires Transform, complete with a modified logo in 2007, about a week before Transformers came out in theaters, so they tried to use this show as a cash grab again to sell to confused children and parents who just know that their kids like the robot car people, and boy, did it not work. As of this video, all volumes released are still available on Amazon and pretty dirt cheap about 15 years later. We're now seven movies deep into the franchise these DVDs were made to capitalize on, and you can still buy the whole series for about 40 bucks, which outside of buying an NFT might be the saddest way to waste that much money. So that is Vampires, and Min had it right from the beginning. This show feels like a fever dream. It's the kind of thing my brain would invent if I spent a 90s Saturday morning in the midst of the worst flu I ever had. Aside from the funny hippie man, nothing in this show is salvageable, ironically. You got the overacting, the basic plots, the terrible character designs, boring action scenes, more puns than a dad joke convention, and what I'd call the worst CGI animation of the 90s boom. I get that it's hard to do this, that even 5 million isn't much to create an entire TV show, but what's easy to understand is your limits, and clearly, they didn't know theirs. I want to end on a weird note that came up during research, meaning we have to go back to the South Florida Sun Sentinel, because it wasn't just an interview with the animators, they were told the show's original pitch. Vampires has a touch of sarcasm about the excessive consumerism of the modern world. Yes, the perceptive children will pick up on this statement. The story is set in the late 22nd century, where the Earth has more than 400 billion inhabitants. Four hundred billion for the record I, I looked it up the max capacity of this planet is about 10 billion so in about a century i'm assuming we start sprouting gills and overtake the ocean old cars and other scrap metal are thrown into space from an overcrowded earth under project junk jettison undesirable non-essential clutter clutter spelled with a k by the way so apparently ed boone is still around the scrapped cars land on a planet in another solar system and are given human-like personalities, becoming vampires with a greed for speed and a need to feed. How dare this unused pitch have better catchphrases than the actual show? The vampires, with Dracula as their leader, eventually become heroes and, in exchange for fuel, protect other mechanical survivors from the Earth against car villains called Scars. So you're telling me they had an original story, which sounds way better, and scrapped it entirely, meaning either they realized the animation would make it too expensive, or Abrams Gentle decided that it was too hard, so Power Rangers with car puns it is, and somehow it still turned out worse than when the Power Rangers were cars.
We're here to toss your salad. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like or a comment below. Seriously, these are kind of hard to make, so if you like it, I need to hear it. And thank you to Party Demonus and Pumpkin Potion for putting me up to it. Please, go check them out. They are both great at what they do. Until next time.